Welcome to another edition of Pod Jerky. I'm your host, Tom. And on today's episode, we have a very special treat for you. We have co star of Two Broke Girls, among many other things, Matthew Moy. Welcome to the show. What's up, Tom? Good to be here. So cool um, to be on this podcast. Love jerky, love Canada. You're from Toronto, right? I am, yes. I have many good friends in Canada. I, w- I want to move there one day. Have you been to Canada? I have. That's what made me fall in love with it. I went to Toronto. Well, I mean, I went as a kid with my parents. But you know when you travel with your parents, you kind of don't pay attention. And you're like, oh, I'm on a trip with my parents. Um, but later in my life, I traveled solo, and I love Toronto. I live in Burbank. And Toronto, for me, is like a mix of Burbank and San Francisco, which is where I'm from in California. So I really like that. And Vancouver was cool, too. Vancouver, the air was so fresh. I don't know if you Canadians can concur on this, but it's it's like I got a shot of B12 in my ass. It was really cool. (laughs) I was like, oh, Uh, this is what fresh air is like. (laughs) Yeah, Toronto is really cool. Lots of stuff to do here. Uh, I'm just outside of Toronto. I was there for 30 years, and then I moved just uh, in a suburb outside of Toronto. uh, So I'm about half an hour away from there now. But uh, so much to do there. Yeah, 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 definitely. So I generally start my interviews now with the new norm. And how is COVID treating you? Great. I've lived alone for the past 10 years once I figured out I don't like roommates. So I live with my cat. We're cool. We're chill. Same routine as always. I've been doing a lot of voiceover. Um, I mean, I've always done voiceover. When I moved to L.A., I was doing voiceover. But uh I don't know. Voiceover really picked up during COVID because everybody had to have home studios and we all had to have professional gear at home. So I've been kind of inundated with that. That's why I'm all interested in microphones. I'm like, oh, what microphone are you using? Um, But yeah, everything's been fine. I was thinking about starting a garden and then I'm like, will I ever take care of it? What would my dad say? He would say, no, you're never going to take care of it. Just go buy your vegetables. <laughs> so that's where I'm at. <laughs> yeah, you guys have a high case count out there. What is your uh, like lockdown procedure right now? Are you mandated to stay inside or are you allowed to just go wherever you want? Prob- no, we're not definitely not allowed. Well, I mean, we have to wear masks everywhere. Um, God, there have been so many mandates and reopenings and reshutdowns, reopenings, reshutdown. I don't know where we are right now. I know for the holidays, like you were not allowed to go to parties and like more than probably like three or four people. <laughs> um, I have no idea. I just stay inside all the time. Um, I don't want to get sick anyway. Like even if COVID wasn't, I don't like getting sick. <laughs> so now that's yeah. like. A lot of people are sick. I'm like, nope, definitely not going out unless it's the grocery store. <laughs> yeah, that's the same here. We have, uh, we're actually in a lockdown right now. We're we're being told to stay home. Uh, we don't have a extremely high case count compared to the U.S. I think we're averaging about 3,400 a day in our province. Yeah, uh, which isn't extremely high, but it is high for us. And yeah. uh, they're be- we're being told to stay home. So a lot of workplaces are being working from home and yeah so it's crazy it's crazy just that this is the new norm and and a lot of these podcasts actually blew up because the same reason you said the voiceover work is happening is because of the lockdown and because of covid a lot of people just started to get into podcasting because they were bored and they wanted something to do and start a new hobby yeah and a lot of people and i don't really understand this because i'm sort of a solitary introverted person anyway but who talks to himself too much probably um (laughs) but um some of my friends get super depressed and they like some of my extroverted friends they're like i need to be with people don't you miss that don't you miss going outside for walks and me i'm like no not really but i'm understanding that so some a lot of people like need to start these podcast things just to like get social interaction. Do you agree with that too? I feel like, I don't I know. Do. I do. I, there was a, there was like a big boom of podcasts that started when all of this hit. We actually started uh, planning this back in December of last year uh, mm. before anything had come to light. And uh, we had no idea that we were going to be locked down and uh, we didn't release our first episode until April. We had all the planning stages and getting the equipment ready and all that stuff from December until April. Uh, planned everything out and then april we 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 launched our first episode but 
a lot of podcasts did get into it just because of that. And they just continue to go on with it because they enjoy it so much. But it was based on, I guess, maybe boredom that this all started. It's amazing. You got a great setup, great sign, great name. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Appreciate that. It's all going to be great. It's all going to be gravy. Yeah. Like, <laughs> well, it's funny in the, in one of the messages that you had sent, we had, we had been uh, communicating on messages and said that, uh, you, you love ketchup chips, you, like different things that are I in Canada. I ketchup chips, but I want my friend, any of my Canadian friends, FYI, if you're listening to this, all I want is a bag of ketchup chips next time you visit me. <laughs> I, I will I will uh, work out to get you some there. I sent uh, some to a friend of mine who's another podcaster in New York. Uh, she had never had ketchup chips, never heard of ketchup chips. I sent it to her and she said, these are the best things on the planet. Why do we not have these? Is it like, see, my taste buds are curious right now. Is it like barbecue with like onions and a little more sour? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, th- I-, I love them. They're my favorite chip. Uh, they... They, they don't taste like ketchup. It's that that's what you're going to get. You're not going to get like that ketchupy taste, but it's more of a, like a barbecuey taste. Yeah. With the sweetness to it. Yeah. Yeah. See, that's over here. We in the States, uh, we mm-hmm. have barbecue chips and then anything more like tomato. We, we call like garden variety or like vegetables, you know, but uh, yeah. wait. Yeah. Yeah, I'll definitely get some for you if you if uh, you're you're really interested in having some of those. Yeah, that's a promise. <laughs> yeah, definitely. All right, so let's get a little bit uh, about the acting and uh, what started you in acting and what gave you that acting bug. Oh man, so I wasn't always a born actor. You know how there are a lot of actors that are born actors. They're like, I'm going to be the greatest actor of all someday. Um, I was actually really shy as a kid. Um, I didn't really break out of my shell till I was like maybe 15 or 16. Uh, I never wanted to talk to any of my parents' friends at the parties at our house. My, my parents loved to host parties and, um, I would, you know, just stay in a corner and like want to eat by myself. And they're like, why aren't you talking to anybody? I don't know. And then when I was in high school, I had a lot of friends in the theater club doing theater. And finally, I was like, man, I want to do fun stuff with my friends. So I joined theater. And I don't know. I guess this is what happens when you bottle everything up inside. Uh, when, like, you just, like, kind of go all out when you do something. Just so, like, you can get it over with. That's how I approached my first audition for theater. What was I audition? I don't even remember. And then I got one of the, like, supporting lead roles in my first show. Just because... I don't want to say I had the confidence to go balls out. I had the f- so much fear of not wanting to fail and just wanting to do something with my friends that I did it. And that's and anyway, so that was like a hobby in high school. I went to college. I majored in Japanese, minored in linguistics, so completely left field. I to me, acting was not a tangible thing, you know. Um. But then I graduated from college, and like I'm sure many college students, not everyone, many of them, uh, I went to my mom, I called her, I was like, "Ah, I don't like my Japanese major anymore, kind of don't want to be a teacher in Japan anymore, I interned for a bit, that wasn't for me, I mean, still love Japanese, just not for me, what should I do? Because, you know, once you're almost done completing a major, you don't want to feel like you've wasted all your money, right? Thousands on thousands of dollars, right? Thank goodness I was not punished for the end of my life. Uh, no, she was like, well, you know, you used to do acting and you were, you really liked it. And she was like, and I know you love cartoons and you love shows. So why don't you try voice acting so you don't have to go in front of the camera? And I was like, oh, that's perfect. Because my mom's a speech and language therapist, or she was, she's retired now. So, I mean, we've always liked things with the voice anyway. Just, it's fascinating. So I was like, that's a cool idea. So I went to a voiceover academy in Sausalito, really close to San Francisco, San Francisco called Voice Tracks with an X. Voice Tracks with an X. And I studied there for two, two and a half years. I treated it like my graduate studies. And I fell in love with that. 
so eventually my plan was to move to LA and get an agent. Luckily, I made an extra good plan, landed an agent while I was still in San Francisco so they could bring me to LA, and then um, moved to LA, and in the back of my mind, I was like, you know, I should probably start taking acting classes. One, it'll help my voiceover. Two, just in case the voiceover thing doesn't work out, I'll have maybe some other acting venue to fall upon. And sure enough, I was right. Eight months of doing voiceover, barely booked any work. Every voice actor goes through this panic attack, though. Six to eight months, they're like, oh my god, I'm not booking anything with my agency. Are they going to drop me? Every actor goes through that. And I, I went through the same thing. But luckily, I had been taking, I was taking like acting, different acting classes like six days a week. And I think that helped um, with my, I don't want to say success, but me getting work, you know? I remember, you know, some of my friends, you know, you know, while everybody's going out for coffee and lunches and video games, I was taking like different like casting director workshops groundlings, acting classes, method acting classes, like six days a week. That was my life for like a year and a half. And um, I wound up finding a small manager and I sure enough booked my first audition on the show called Mind of Mencia. And um, it was wild. I never wanted to be an on-camera actor, but that work wound up uh, overtaking my voiceover work. I mean, I love doing both. I was originally a voice actor, though, but the on-camera thing came way later. Yeah, you've done quite a bit of work. I mean, you've been in quite a few shows. You've had appearances on shows. You've done quite a bit of voiceover work as well. Yeah, that's where I started. That's that's my roots, man, is voiceover and animation. I was brought to L.A. for animation. And, well, I, you know, I don't want to say the on-camera stuff came later. Actually, that hit bigger first. And it's still continuing to be, you know, my primary moneymaker. But, you know, it, it's just wild how life works out. You, you you get really set on one thing and then life takes a different turn sometimes, you know? Yeah, definitely, for sure. So the two broke girls, you started on that show. And I got to tell you, it's one of my favorite shows. Love watching that show. I'm so uh, happy. I, I I get the comedy of it. Um, I like the puns on it. It's just it's just a well put together show. And I know there was a lot of, I guess, feedback on it where there was people saying that, you know, you portrayed a certain character the way that you portrayed your character. And you had uh, responses back to that. And you said that comedy is really something that you kind of want to take to the edge. You know, you want to take things to the edge. You want to be able to... Uh, put things out there. And and I think this show did that perfectly. Yeah, and, um, oh man, there's so many things to say about that. Uh, you know, number one, some of the jokes were really old-fashioned in the beginning, and that was the roots of our show. No, let me start even further back. When I auditioned for that show, um, as a young actor you just want to try to book a show you know and um when i went to that audition people don't realize how many other you know a lot of people can be like oh how can you as an asian you know take that role but there were a, there were like hundreds of people at that audition and we all probably thought the same thing in our minds oh man we're kind of unsure about this show but i knew in my mind from my training that sitcoms always change with the actor over seven years, if they last seven years. You know, they do, God bless. Uh, you know, Seinfeld. Um, I remember in my early days, my acting training, my teacher was like, Seinfeld, were they like, they were in episode one by, you know, season what, 10? No, not, not at all. Even like Friends. When did Joey all of a sudden become obsessed with food and all he had was food jokes? That was like a later thing you develop with the actor as you get to know them. So right. I kind of had in the back of my mind kind of a weird, I don't, I don't want to say power trip, but, but like, I'm like, I know if I, if they grab on some things they like about me, that'll become part of the character, you know? So anyway, knowing that in my mind, I was like, okay, so this kind of helped me take command of the reins a little bit more, which was kind of a cool thing. Um, 
so there were a lot of other, there were like Korean actors, there were Japanese actors, China, mm, there aren't too many Chinese people in LA. I'm not sure how many Chinese actors there were. Um, but anyway, so I got the part. Um, but talking about that comedy thing, pushing it to the edge. Yeah, you know, our show always tried to do that. That was just the nature of our show. Like, because we were a sexual show, I mean, we always, or the writers and the creator always wanted to put, I mean, he came, Michael Patrick King, Sex in the City. He's making a new one. That, I mean, that's his thing. And uh, we called our show Highbrow, Lowbrow. We always tried to push the lowbrow jokes to the furthest, but... I'm glad you said the thing about puns. We always try to keep it classy and smart with the puns. A lot of people like who did publicity or promos who are fans of the show who would do the publicity or promos with stuff would try to write their own jokes in Two Broke Girls style. And sometimes they weren't that good. It takes it took a lot of um cleverness. I don't know how to say it to, to write a good Two Broke Girls jokes. Weird to say. It takes a a lot of intellect to write a good pun. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I don't know where I was heading with that, but yeah. <laughs> and and how long generally does it take you to record an episode? Oh, uh, well, it would it would take us one week. Um, we would start with the table read day, then the next two days would, would be for rehearsals. And um, the fr each day after rehearsal, we'd have a run through the first day with the writers and our boss, Michael Patrick King, and then and all the producers. And then the second day would be for the network, everybody at the network. So like first day, well, table read, next day rehearsal, then about like 25 people. Then the next day, final rehearsal with about 50 to, I don't a lot of people, like more than 50 people. And then it's kind of like a whole theater show, you know? And um, then Mondays and Tuesdays, Mondays we would do, luckily, see, there's some sitcoms that go have a Monday through Friday schedule. So Monday's their first day and Friday's their last day. But it was kind of a blessing in disguise. We had a Wednesday through Tuesday schedule. So Saturday and Sunday, we'd have the weekend off, which thank God gave me more time to memorize because we had so many writing changes on that show and our scripts would be, we would have like, sometimes we would have a script that was 59 pages that we knew they would have to cut by, you know, filming day. Our show is only what, 19 minutes long after you take out the commercials. How do you fit 59 pages in 19 minutes? That's why our show moves so fast. Um, so you either get it or miss it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so thankfully we had the weekend to memorize. And then Monday we would do like the technical stuff, shooting like all the gags or anything that had, we'd have cream or something like thrown over us or blood. <laughs> um, and then that day we'd have to wash it off because we're not going to do that in front of the live studio audience because then you got to take a shower every time. And then Tuesday we would do much, do pretty much like 70 to 80% of the show in front of the live studio audience, which is always a trip. We'd always get different people. Who either get it or don't get it. But, you know, it was really funny on days when they didn't get it. We'd be like, why aren't they getting it? It was funny. One day on St. Patrick's Day, we had like a dead crowd. And it's St. Patrick's Day. And that was, was it the leprechaun episode where I'm dressed up as a leprechaun? I don't yeah. remember. Yeah. That was a really fun episode. And we had Lindsay Craft. We had one of the Murrays. And um, they weren't laughing. And we're like, why aren't they laughing? And I think Michael Patrick King, he was like, it's because all the young people are out drinking right now. We've got the older crowd and we're like, oh, I get it. I get it now. <laughs> yeah, that was a good ep episode. That's where Earl was uh, part of the uh, the band there with the bagpipes. and. Uh, oh, that's right. And then yeah. DJ comes in. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, that was, that was a good episode. Yeah. Now, it seems on the show that your cast is really cohesive, that like you have really good cast to work with. How are they together, I guess, working with them all together? Oh, you know, that's one of the most amazing, that's why our show, I think, was so successful. You know, I really think that a great team of people m will foster great success. I always called our 
cast, a great football team. You know, we had Kat Dennings, who was like the quarterback. And then you had Beth, who, you know, had the adaptability to do anything. Because all of us, except for Jen and Garrett, um, we're all kind of, I don't want to say new, but kind of like unknowns, you know? So, um, and we all fit together. We all meshed really well. Everybody's super nice, super kind, which is different than being nice. Um, and everybody was compassionate. Everybody worked super hard. And there was a high bar of excellence on our show. So it was just great. Um, we all still keep in touch, even though we're not working together anymore. And yeah, the girls are like sisters to me. Jonathan became one of my best friends. Uh, Garrett, funny enough, checks up me, checks up on me more than I should. I should be checking up on him more during COVID. You know, he's like, Matthew, you're still doing okay. You're not sick, are you? <laughs> Great guy. Yeah, that's good to have like that family cohesiveness o o almost uh, during a filming, I guess, right? Yeah, and you know, everybody always knocks on me saying, oh, we're like a family in interviews. But no, we really were like a family. And I remember those mornings. Every morning, you know, we would sit around the diner tables reading the scripts or just chatting about life. Yeah, I mean, any that's why partly the diner scenes are some of the best scenes because you can feel that hominess. I wanted to take home one of the, the booths um, when we wrapped because, you know, they ask people if you want to take home stuff. And I'm like, all I want is <laughs> to have the booth as my kitchen table. And they're like, yeah, we rented those. So I was like, okay, I get it. <laughs> I'll take one anyways. <laughs> no, I, I, I didn't. The only thing I got back was the back of my uh, director's chair. It says Matthew Moy, which is fine. I didn't really want anything anyway. I think Jonathan took, he got the bell, the ding, ding, the bell for a yep. pickup. Yeah. Now, I was actually talking about this with my wife the other night because we're actually watching the series right now. Uh, I think we're on season four right now. And I was talking about uh, this with her uh, the other night. And I said, I don't think the series works as well as it did without the back and forth with you and Kat. Uh, you and Max, uh, how do you feel about that? Because I think the, the the back and forth with you two was awesome. Oh yeah, it's always it's always been amazing. I mean, she was always God. Everybody, so every, there are so many people through the years who had back and forth on me in that show. But yeah, I guess yeah, it all started with Max because she was working at the diner first with Oleg, and um, but Oleg and I had a different sort of relationship on the show. But yeah, it was always great, and Kat became one of my really good friends in the show, too, which I think showed, you know, eventually. I mean, it really helped that none of us didn't get along. Was that the right phrase? That none of us were unfriendly, because I think that would have shown on the show. And um, I remember <laughs> I went to Kat's house for Halloween once. That was really fun. <laughs> yeah, we, we always had good back and forth. It, it made the show. I mean, there's so many things. I remember my scenes with Jen, too. Like, I would have so much trouble not cracking whenever Jen spoke to me on the show, like, in character. Like, to look her in the eye, man, and to finish your jokes, it's a battle. <laughs> a battle of not smiling and laughing. <laughs> well, like, yeah, that, that's kind of I'm a question I would ask back. is... Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I would ask you, like, how do you stay in character... When you have like Jennifer Coolidge that's that's actually speaking like that to you, how do you keep a straight face? Right. So I asked Ted Wass, one of our directors, this early on in one of our seasons. I was like, Ted, how do I? Because Ted was the dad in Blossom. It's like Ted, how do you do it? He's like, you just gotta have balls of steel. And I was like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Okay, I I asked him that because I couldn't keep a straight face when I walked out of the walk-in with the mayonnaise. Do you remember that scene? Where yeah, I forget, yeah. something happens that I see and I and I come out with a tub of mayonnaise with this look of disgust and I couldn't stop cracking up because it's a big reveal. Um, and I was like, how do I, because you know, you don't want to crack up during the run-throughs either because if you mess up the joke, sometimes producers be like, oh, that didn't work, you know? So you, and you want to set, you're kind of like a salesman of comedy during the rehearsals, you want to sell the jokes. 
and prove that you can sell them, you know? And that was a really good joke that I didn't want to have being rewritten. Luckily, I got through it. It's balls of steel, man. And I realized later on when doing scenes of Jen, I was like, oh, man, I just got to kind of throw that ball back. You know, I know she's going to throw it at me and it's going to be like a huge spike in the face. And I just got to bat it back. It's a weird comedic analogy. <laughs> but well, it, it's something that you guys are able to do because I know it doesn't matter how many times I've watched this show and I, I have watched it hundreds of times this show. Uh, I've seen all six seasons multiple times and I still laugh at the jokes, even though I know they're coming and I still laugh at it. Uh, my wife's the same way. She'll still laugh at it as well. And it's just, I, I, I don't know if I could handle that situation the way that you guys would in that moment. Oh, well, you know, <laughs> I mean, yeah, sometimes jokes would get us, but also, you know, we're, we became very seasoned, you know, throughout the years and we heard those jokes all the time. And oh yeah, people are always like, don't you get tired of short jokes, Matt? And I'm like, no, not if they're a good short joke, you know, because I've heard so many. So when I hear a new great one, I'm like, oh, that's a good short joke, man. But no, uh, once you're like practiced and doing this thing for a while, you know, you, you, you get with the program and you learn to keep, keep, keep the well-oiled machine moving. <laughs> but it's hard, man. Sometimes it'd be hard. It'd be hard not cracking up. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so who was the biggest prankster on set? We never really had pranksters. We we weren't one of those sets. Um, I don't know. What? Uh, one thing that was funny was uh, Beth in real life is a little more goofy than Kat. Kat's a little more conservative, where I think on the show, Max was maybe more outlandish. And Beth was supposed to be the uppity one. I mean, Kat's not uppity in real life, but she's more conservative, you know? Um, but um, nobody really pulled any pranks. I think one, maybe one time for a blooper reel, we had like a chicken come down from the ceiling. But that was a planned event. <laughs> okay. Not planned, but where we talked, we're like, oh, we're going to do that to these people, you know? But we never really did, because we all just, I don't know. I don't know why we never pulled pranks on each other. Good question. <laughs> <laughs> did you have any, like, behind-the-scenes stories that you can share with us that the people who actually watch the show don't know about? Um, just how cool some of those guest stars were. I mean, we got Hal Linden, one of my favorite... As an actor, it's so cool to watch these legendary veterans work in their field of expertise. Like Hal came from Barney Miller, right? And um, that guy was a pro. During our little breaks, he would just sit and like look at his lines. Super relaxed, super nice guy to talk to. And every take, he'd nail it. Even some of us, we were like, man, we should bring that guy back. Because I think he played the landlord for it. You might have not gotten there yet, because I think it might be a season five episode, but he plays the landlord for uh, the building. Or maybe not the landlord, the guy who actually owns the apartment. I don't remember. Oh, and um, we had Valerie Harper, super kind soul. And um, oh, we had Lindsay Lohan. People always ask about that. <laughs> um, Lindsay was a sweet soul. God bless her heart. She was late. But, you know, I, it's, it's hard. I, I always give people the benefit of the doubt. It's hard when you've lived that life as, as a child actor. And I don't want to say people do things for you, but you just kind of have no structure because you're just kind of going with the motions of everything and how the business is going. So, but when she was there, she was great to work with and she loved working with us. You know, she came to visit us the next week. She's like, hey, by herself. <laughs> and she, she she doesn't come with an entourage. And she's like, hey, if you guys ever want me back, you know, I had a lot of fun. Um, she was super nice. Um, I didn't get to talk to Kim Kardashian because that was like an end of the day filming thing. But I think she was nice, too. Um, we had so many people. You know, it's the girls got to work with most of the really famous guests because they were in those scenes, you know. Um 
the stripper episode, that was really funny. That was a fun episode for all of us. Man, I remember that week. That was the, at that point in my life, that was the most lines I ever had to learn in a short period of time. I had to learn 39 pages by like, and have them pretty much down by that Friday. And I was freaking out. I was like, how am I going to do this? So I was practicing with our dialogue coach. I practiced with my acting coach in my life and I on then rehearsing on set and we got it done. And it was, I think, you know, it's one of the greatest episodes of Two Broke Girls just because uh, it's, it's just a fun episode. And well, I love it because we get to see part of Han's life, you know. <laughs> well, and that's the episode where your comes in. And uh, the stripper episode, she she gives you the girlfriend experience. Uh, that's yeah, that that's, episode, right? That's one of my good friends, um, Ali Maki, and we've worked together before, so that, it's really cool. I, I've known Ali for many years now. We were actually in China together randomly, so we traveled together for a bit. And then uh, m- the mother, uh, Karen Maruyama, a really nice lady. She's, she comes from Groundlings, and um, so it was just cool cool to work with them would you say that's one of your favorite episodes that episode was great um the episode where i pull out the gun out of the fanny pack early episode that's great um what else oh one of my favorite episodes do you oh no you haven't gotten there yet you might have oh i've watched all of i've watched all of the seasons we're just re-watching them (laughs) God bless. God bless. Um, you know, some people really like the show and some people don't like the show. And I get it. Because if it's not your type of humor, I'm like, I get it. You know, like my neighbor across the street, he's like, sorry, Matthew, don't watch it. Don't like it. I'm like, that's fine. I get it. I get it. Um, so the cacao episode was really fun. Uh, where my hair is crazy and I like have a not a coke addiction but a cacao addiction and he has like he has to turn the pages with the duck thing that that's really funny you know uh in part of that episode if you watch closely a little puff of cacao comes out of my breath when i speak on one of the jokes and that was like a little hidden nugget thing we found in um on the day of filming we were rehearsing because we like do a rehearsal blocking for the cameras and our, I think our director was Don, Don Scardino. He was like, Matt, do you really want to do the cacao thing? Because, you know, it's, bit, it's you're having bitter cocoa in your mouth. I'm like, I want to do it. I'm, I'm sort of like Lady Gaga. I want to have the thing in my hand and do it so I know what it's like when we actually do it. He's like, okay. So we did it. And in the moment, I found this thing where I could, like, create a breath of, like, cocoa out of my mouth on the joke. And then we decided to do it for filming, and it stayed in. So, you know, it's fun little backstories like that i thought that was fun it's always fun as an actor when you find little things in the moment that you would have never found unless you followed through (laughs) yeah and if you had a message right now for max and caroline what would it be it would be to where have you been for for like four years we're in a pandemic no one is working Man, that would have been crazy uh, to do the show yeah. during the pandemic. We so would have had COVID episodes and so many jokes that would have. Been, how do you think made people laugh? How do you think COVID. it would have made a difference, though? Sorry, how do you make, think it would have made a difference with COVID doing filming during COVID? I'm not sure because I haven't done any um, on camera filming during COVID. I, I, I just haven't booked any jobs, but also sort of grateful that. I don't have to interact with people. So, you know, there's a double-edged sword there. But I, Beth, I know, is working on The Neighborhood, and I've seen some clips on her Instagram. They have, like, PVC pipes. PVC pipes. Put the emphasis on the, on the pipes? No. The PVC pipes, and they have, like, you know, barriers with, you know, uh, acrylic. And they all wear, um, I think, the acrylic face masks. The shields. And some of them have double on. And that's how they're doing it. I know they get tested like either every day or every two days. My friend Eric works on mom. And he says they have to get tested every couple of days. And um, I guess that's how they do it. And I hear from some of my friends in the industry that 
if one of the like series regulars comes down with COVID, they have to stop production. But if one of the crew members or or something gets comes down with it, I don't think they stop. But yeah, it's just a new norm, right? It's just a new new thing that we have to get used to for now. Yeah, hopefully by April, um, we'll all be vaccinated at least. I don't think max ma masks are going to stop for at least another year. I agree. Um, I agree. Yeah. So you've done a lot of uh, voice work. You've done video games. You've done cartoons. Um, do you enjoy doing that more than the acting now? Than the on-camera acting? Um, I enjoy both. I still like to, they both work different parts of my brain. Um, I mean, when you're on camera, you really got to have balls of steel because you're on camera. Everybody can see everything. Like right now, breaking out. Is this too much stress from COVID or too much chocolate in COVID? <laughs> um, can't have that on camera. Right now, I'd be like, gotta lose that 20 pounds you just gained, man. Um, <laughs> voiceover, you have to worry about things like, I cannot have that whole bag of t potato chips because I have to record that audition tomorrow or <laughs> work in that job. Because, you know, salty salt makes you have like mush mouth clicking stuff, you know? Yeah. And I love them both. I mean, I started in voiceover, and now I do both voiceover on camera. Theater is a harder thing that I used to like doing, but, man, I don't know if I have the brain capacity to remember that many lines anymore. It's hard. It's a marathon when you do theater. When you see a good play and it's over, you're like, how did they memorize that many lines? Seriously. Because they paid them well. That's how. If that, or well, actually, a lot of theater they don't get paid well. So I don't know. <laughs> I think they say it's movies. No, TVs where you make the money. Movies you get the 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 what do you call it? the fame? I guess. And then theater you become a great actor. I think that's the old phrase. <laughs> So is there a difference between doing, I guess, voice work for like a television show, like a cartoon and a video game? Um, yeah, there are different, um, um, I don't want to say techniques, but for like for video games, you have to usually in the video games now, it, a lot of them are like the military, like Call of Duty or some sort of game where you have to do a lot of shouting. <laughs> So I think in the union contract, it was like revised many, maybe maybe within the last eight years where they had a thing for that at least made producers put a warning in the auditions, be like, hey, this job may throw out your voice. It may be harsh on your voice. You know, if you get this job, be aware because some video games can do that. Like, especially, like, some games I've done, like, a Japanese accent, and I have to do this lower voice. And if I do that, like, for four hours, man, like, I, I've, it's like I've been chain smoking, you know? And it's called, like, a vocal fry, and your voice is just thrown out for, like, a couple of days. Um, but cartoons and animation, I mean, there's a lot of shouting in that, too, but it's more like, um, sometimes there isn't shouting, and sometimes can be a bit zanier it depends there are a lot of grounded animated cartoons now where they want you to be real and there's a lot of old school zany cartoon cartoons where they want you to be a cartoon it's hard <laughs> to describe <laughs> yeah uh, and you worked on one of the shows called Steven Universe, right? And you did the voice yeah, of Lars. Steve, that was also, I loved doing that show while I was doing Two Broke Girls because, like, they would both, it'd be like, oh, after all the, um, uh, I don't want to say the stress of Two Broke Girls, but all of just working at that fast of a pace, then I get to do Steven Universe, which was so fun. And everybody was so kind on that show. And, um, 
you know, Dee Dee, who plays Pearl, you know, I eventually started going to church with her, and that's how close all of us became, and it was just, it's so cool that worked a different part of my brain, and God, that show did so many things, it, it, it brought so many, um, so much acceptance to young children, and having those fans come up to me like during Comic Cons, if I'd just be wandering and they just saying how meaningful the show was to them, I'd be like, wow, that, you know, that's a really cool thing to hear as an actor that you've changed someone's life. I mean, or just as a person, if somebody walked up to you, be like, Tom, that podcast changed my life, you'd be like, wow, right? It was just so cool Absolutely. to hear the kids. And then kids started saying fusion more which was wild they were like i'm a fusion and maybe that's a dragon ball thing could be a you know dragon ball maybe have, was the first to do that but you know, i think you know they might have gotten that from steven universe too and just hearing show words come into real life is also a weird thing you're like oh now this is real <laughs> that was a steven universe was a huge thing at comic con Oh my god, I couldn't get into the room after like year, the only time I was able to get into the hall was year one. I think after year one, too many people. <laughs> yeah, I've been to some conventions as well. I've uh, been to actually one for the UFC and like oh, the, the the place was just packed. It was just insane how many people were there. We were lucky because... We ended up going, my neighbor and I ended up going down at one o'clock in the morning. It didn't open till 11. And we were like, you know, I don't want to wait in line when we get there in this huge lineup because it was first come, first serve to get in. And by waiting in line outside, we were actually tweeting with some of the companies that were running in there. And we got a chance to get autographs first from some of the fighters that were there. And it was really, really cool. So, That's so cool, uh, man. It, it, it paid off to go early even though we were super tired, but uh, it, it was pretty cool. But it was so busy in the convention. Yeah, it gets a little overwhelming when it gets busy, to be honest. But conventions are cool because so many random things can happen, you know? So many cool random things. I mean, yeah, for how sure. many? I think Comic-Con is one of the only events where so many stars from current shows or movies are packed into one place and they may be eating at the restaurant next door could be game of thrones right <laughs> yeah yeah for sure so you've had, had a, uh, like appearances on like you've been on scrubs you've been on another one of my favorites how i met your mother uh you've been on criminal minds my wife and i watch that show religiously they would have marathons on here every weekend uh, on tv um, how are those shows being on those? And did you get to meet any of the main cast scrubs? I know you were on a few more episodes than How I Met Your Mother and Criminal Minds. So, wow. Some of my favorite years. Sorry. Um, burping up my coffee, but I love coffee. I'll never <laughs> stop drinking it. Um, Criminal Minds, they, they still remember. I was on one episode. They all still remember me. They're all... So I know I say this and people are like, oh, I don't believe you, Matt, because you say it about everybody. But they're so nice in that show. And Joe Montaigne, uh, I mean, I saw him at Sushi. I wasn't even in a scene with him. And he after dinner, he comes up or he, he's like, so good to see you, Matthew. And I'm like, how do you how do you remember me? I'm terrible. I never remember anybody's name, you know. And of course, Matthew Gray Goobler who I had the scene with is super great. You know, he was act, it was uh, it was actually really cool. I sneaked to look at his script as an actor and it had so many notes on all the pages. And I was like, man, that guy prepares. I love when I see that. Or Martin Short. I was on um, a pilot once with him called Taxman. Pilot that never became a series. It was like a news radio type of show, but in a, instead we were doing taxes. And I think that's why nobody wanted to watch it, because who wants to watch a show about taxes? But Martin Short, every rehearsal, he'd come to rehearsal with a binder, with tabs, and all of his notes. Were, I was like, man, that's preparation. I love that. Uh, but yeah, Criminal Minds was great. 
uh, Ma Matthew uh, and I, uh, we had to learn all these chess moves outside so fast. And um, there were parrots in the middle of the shoot. Just in LA, there were flocks of parrots sometimes. And they decided in the middle of the day, oh, we're going to take up one of the trees. And all we could hear was parrots. And so I don't, audio had to work that out. And then also audio was like, why did you give Matt, this Matt, Matt Moy, why did you give Matt a windbreaker to wear in his scene? Because windbreakers make a ch -ch -ch sound. Yeah. And yeah. the wardrobe lady was, she's like, that's a $500 jacket. He's not taking it off. <laughs> so there was that to deal with. <laughs> you know, sometimes a wardrobe battles with other people because if it's an expensive piece and they really like it, they want you to wear it. Um, but iCarly, one of my favorite shows to work on, that's a kid's show. They're super great. Uh, I play Rockman with Nathan Crest during the breaks. I got yelled at by the craft late because that was one of my first jobs. I, their craft service was really nice and they had shrimp out and I took a whole bowl of shrimp and the lady was like, what are you doing? Put that back. You're taking too much. <laughs> You're taking too much shrimp. Put back the shrimp. <laughs> Um, I'm like, I'll never eat this again. Um, and then, uh, oh, Scrubs, God, Scrubs. So I got to work with Dave Franco, young, young Dave Franco, uh, Michael Mosley, great friend, um, Carrie Boucher and, uh, Nikki Whelan. They're all doing great off being movie stars. Michael's doing every TV show, every movie ever. I just saw him Peppermint. That was great. Michael's great because he has this, he looks like a nice guy, but then he can play like the guest star villain, you know? And then, you know, Dave's, I think Dave even directed now. I mean, you know, Dave's a huge movie star now. And Nikki's been working with all these famous actors like Nicolas Cage and Bruce Willis and Carrie, you know, became a movie star too. And Argo, they're all doing great. That was a fun set. I think Prentice Penny, one of the writers, became an executive producer of a show. And Prentice was the one who hired me for Scrubs. He was like, that's the guy to play Trang. Um, so Bill Lawrence still remembers me. I, I would see him on the Warner Brothers lot sometimes. One day he just pointed at me and I like locked eyes with him. And I just like gave him a thumbs up. Like, thank you, man. Thank you for my career. Because, you know, it, you know, it's a slow buildup of roles that you get the next one. And Scrubs was a great time. If that show... Because the ninth season was completely different from the first eight seasons. Really, they should have done Scrubs, waited a couple of years, then done like a Scrubs reboot. Because the, our, our show was actually called Scrubs Med School in parentheses, or in brackets. And everybody kind of treated it as a continuation of Scrubs. And they're like, oh, this isn't Scrubs with Zach Braff. We don't like it, so we got canceled after one season, but we were a new show, and um, if that show was out now, people would love it. I, I've watched that show, like, I don't want to say recently, but in the last few years, and I'm like, it still holds up, you know, the jokes still hold up. The random show about Lucy and horses still holds up. Um, but uh, just timing, man, timing of some shows, things get canceled. Really sad. Yeah, and how 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 about two broke girls? Like, do you do you think that that show should have kept going, or do you think they ended it at the right spot? Well, I think it definitely could have kept going and should have at least for one more season because we didn't know the show was ending and we could have at least wrapped things up. That's the only regret I have. But also, since we did leave it on a cliffhanger and everybody seems to re be rebooting shows nowadays. I wouldn't mind at all rebooting the show in a few years when everybody, you know, is finished doing their other shows. They're like, hey, let's go back to Two Broke Girls, see where everybody's at. Um, so, the but if the show was released now, I think it would still hold up. I mean, the thing about penis vagina humor is we're not going to stop having penises and vaginas. It's still going to hold up. <laughs> Dirty jokes always hold up. They do. They do. And I would definitely be watching that if it came back on. Because uh, after the, the sixth season, I was like, no, they got to keep going with this. And and I was disappointed that it ended because it uh, it's, it's actually one of my favorite shows. I really enjoy watching that one. 
Yeah, we would. I mean, it's not a thing to joke about. We would have had so many pandemic jokes. <laughs> not about the sickness itself, but, you know, all the stress around it, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you have any upcoming projects that you're currently working on? Or um, I know you had said you might be going on a couple editions that you might be um, yeah, you know, out for, you know? There are a lot of cool animated things, a lot of cool animated reboots coming out that I can't talk about. But And there are a lot, a few animated things that I've done that I can't. Everything makes you sign an NDA now. It's crazy. Yeah. I've signed more NDAs than the devil would make people sign for their souls. Does that make sense? Terrible analogy. Yes. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> I just want to tell people, I'm not going to tell anybody anything. Just make, just sign it for me. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of cool, you know, I frequently play elves. So expect, expect me in a lot of Christmas special things. <laughs> expect me at least once a year <laughs> um, to hear my voice. Um, Steven Universe sadly ended. That was sad. I wish we were doing more of that. And wish we were still doing too... Man, if we were still doing too broke, what would it would be like season 11. That'd be crazy. Everyone would be married in the show, probably. <laughs> well, except... Except maybe, Max, who never wants to get married. No, Max would definitely have gotten married. And Caroline would have gotten married. And, um, Han would be ordaining. And, oh, no, Oleg and Sophie already got married. They'd be on, like, yep. their 12th kid. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Okay, can you give everybody uh, a big shout-out in the best Han voice that you can do? Uh, just, uh, I guess, just say hello to everybody. Uh, thank everybody for tuning into the show, however you want to end it. Sure, absolutely. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for watching and the being a fan all these years. I know we had so many dirty jokes, but the diner was kind of dirty, too. Han didn't say that, though. Um, thank you so much. Thank you for sticking with us. Thank you for watching. Watch Pod Jerky all the time, every week, every month, every hour. This is the show, and thank you so much. Awesome. Okay, so we're going to wrap this interview up here. But again, like I said, uh, the invitation is open for you to join us on our virtual convention. Um, I will send you a reminder if you are interested in doing it. Uh, we'd love to have you on. Uh, like I said, we had Adam Bush on on our last one. Uh, we try to get somebody to come on and just... Uh, kind of shoot the shit with us, give a little bit of surprise to the entire crowd that we have uh, watching us. I think we're about 1,500 people in our group right now that uh, tune in. Wow. And uh, yeah, so it's so, so it's, it's pretty fun. Like a live and uh, to the fans, right? Yeah, so we have the group open and then uh, we do what we did on the last one was we did a full 51 hours straight of podcasting. So each one gets a 45 minute slot and it went 51 straight hours and we have like panels in, in between uh, where we talk about networking and we talk about just, you know, we have different games going on. Uh, so it turns out to be pretty fun and uh, we'd love to have you on as a guest if you're, if you're interested. Absolutely. 110%. I would love to just remind me, <laughs> but yeah, yes. Awesome. Definitely, for sure. So I think talk, everyone is going to be very happy. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. I want to say thank you very much for coming on the show today. Really appreciate you taking the time out of your day uh, to sit here and talk with me. Uh, I know everyone's going to enjoy this. I know I have told a couple of friends that you were coming on, and they were super excited. I uh, haven't told the podcast community yet uh, because I wanted to make sure we got it done first. Uh, but my neighbors that I was talking to, and they were like, oh, my God. They were like, I love them. Uh, this, that's going to be great. I can't wait till that interview comes out. So I said, it'll be out Monday as long as I get the interview done on Thursday. So it'll be ready to go out Monday. I'll send you the links for sure so that uh, you can share it if you want. Oh, my God. I want to meet them all. Let's all have dinner. <laughs> we'll do it. <laughs> done. Done. Awesome. Again, thank you so much for coming on. As always, stay safe, be kind to each other, and we will see you later. Happy 2021.